through the book of Mark. And this morning we are coming across a very powerful text. And all all texts are powerful, but this one specifically for what we're going to be talking about. It's Mark 8, 31 to chapter 9, verse 1. And what I think we are looking at today is really the central theme, the, the whole point of what we believe in. And that's a big thing to say, that that what we're going to be looking at is the central theme to Christianity. And as Christians, many of us can have different ideas of what it's all about. What what is what is the whole point of, of Christianity? This week on Facebook, I just I just wanted to get a feel for what people think it's all about. So I asked on, on Facebook for and that's a dangerous thing to do for ask for people's opinions on Facebook, but what I asked is for people to summarize what do you think Christianity is all about in one sentence? Like to you, what do you think it's all of, all about? <clears throat> and I got a lot of answers that I knew I would get. All about love, all about all about loving God and loving our neighbors, and I completely agree. But what I think we mistake sometimes is what does it actually mean? To love God. We know what it means to love others. We, we, we try our best. We, we put up with each other. But what does it mean to love God? And I think the thing we have to understand is God has told us how to love him. And last week we talked a lot about not wanting to be God ourselves. That, that sometimes we want to make the rules. That we want to be in charge. But God has made it very clear to us of what we must do to have a relationship with him. So that's not up to us to, to decide. So we're looking at Mark 8, 31 to 9, 1. And we're looking at the theme of self-denial. Jesus has taught about many things. He's done many miracles. But here in Mark 8, Jesus gives us one of the clearest pictures of what it actually means to follow after him. What it actually means to be a Christian. And that is self-denial. So let's read from Mark 8, 31 to 9, verse 1. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come up after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father and the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come in power. So we see Jesus here is talking to his disciples. He has an interaction with Peter where Peter rebukes him. He rebukes Peter back. And then he gives this very clear picture to everyone there, the disciples, anyone else around, of what it actually means to follow after him. So what is self-denial? And, and we've talked about this a lot, but the essence of sin in Genesis, when you, when you look back to the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve taking the fruit, it's ultimately us wanting to be God. It's us wanting to be in charge. It's us wanting to replace him. And in Ezekiel 28, when you look at the fall of Satan, and, and Hope at our, at our youth group this week did a study on angels, and, and I loved it, and I hope our youth did as well, but it's how did Satan fall? Before, before sin came to earth through us humans, Satan fell. And it's the same thing. When you look at him in Ezekiel 28, he wanted to be God. He wanted to replace him. He got prideful. He had, he had all of this in himself. And that same problem exists in all of us. We want to be in charge. We want to be the determiners of right and wrong and make our own plan for our life. And so when you see Jesus talking about picking up our cross and following him, sometimes, and, and I've heard this used a lot, we can, we can use the, the whole picking up our cross and following after Jesus when we're doing a hard task. When, when you're mowing your lawn and it's hot out and you don't want to, you're, you're picking up your cross and following after Jesus. And we use it that way. But what we have to remember, and, we, and this is important with any text you look at, is what was the original context. And almost 
all of the disciples and many of these early Christians following Jesus, picking up your cross was not a metaphor. It was a literal thing. You were, by being a Christian, by proclaiming Jesus, you were sentencing yourself to death. And in places in the world, it is the same case today. So it was not metaphorical. But the cross does symbolize things for us. It symbolizes two things, namely death, the death of ourselves, but also our hope. And as Christians, we can focus on the hope aspect of the cross a lot. We look at the cross, we see the resurrection, we see that all of our hope is in that. We can go to heaven because of that. But what we have to see as well is Jesus is telling us we also have to pick up our cross and follow him. If we want to have the glory of the resurrection, we too must die on the cross with Jesus. The cross represents hope and the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. But what Jesus is showing us, and it's really the summary of, of what it means to be a Christian, is that we have to die to ourselves. And what I mean by that, by our sinful self, our self that is wanting to be God, our prideful nature, we have to give up control of that and put it to death on the cross. So self-denial is the putting off of the old nature, that putting that part of yourself to death and living in this new nature we have as Christians. And we have to be careful when we talk about self-denial because self-denial is not hating yourself. It's not hating yourself. Self-denial is not being miserable all the time. It's not walking around being solemn, not enjoying life, and trying to live a life of righteousness to pay back God. That's not what self-denial is. It's also not self-flagellation. It's not hurting yourself. There's, there's different monastic cults that do that. It's, it's hurting yourself and suffering for your own sins. But that's not what self-denial is. <coughs> God wants us to live in self-denial. So not so that we can have unhappy lives where we're not enjoying anything in this world. God wants us to live a life of self-denial so we can actually live the life we were intended to live. So that we can be truly happy and have joy and experience him. Because what, what we've seen with sin, to live for the self, to live for the inner sinful nature, leads to death. It might lead to temporary happiness. And, we, and you see that in the world. Sin is enjoyable in the short term. But it ultimately leads to death. It leads to the death of yourself. So we are going to be looking at three aspects of self-denial that this text brings up. And that is self-denial in regards to your plan for your life. Self-denial in regards to your purpose for your life. And self-denial in regards to the presentation of your life. So the first aspect we're going to be looking at is in regards to your plan. So that's in verses 31 to 33, if you can look there with me. And he began to teach them many things that the Son of Man must, oh, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of God. Of man. Can you imagine being rebuked by Jesus that way? Get behind me, Satan. I don't think there's a stronger rebuke than that. And I think that is for a reason. And we're going to be looking at this. So we see Jesus has been teaching his disciples. He's at the height of his ministry. He has a big following. He's not popular with the Pharisees and the religious crowd, but everyone else loves him. He's been doing miracles. And then he tells his disciples the great news, but they interpret it as the bad news, that actually he is going to die. That he's going to suffer, he's going to die, but he will be raised from the dead after, the, after three days. And they, they ignore the, the resurrection part. And then Peter takes Jesus aside and he rebukes him. And I find this very interesting. After following Jesus faithfully, after sacrificing everything for him, Peter is a fisherman, he gave it all up. He gave up his career and was following after Jesus. But hearing this, he takes his master aside and rebukes him. So what we have to look at, why is, this, why is this the breaking point for Peter? Why is he rebuking Jesus here? There is a lot of things Jesus did which were countercultural. There were a lot of things Jesus did which you would, in our society, we, we rebuke each other all the time. We would rebuke each other for. But back then, to rebuke your master was huge. So why is he rebuking him here? And I think that despite everything, despite Peter giving up everything and following Jesus... This was the first time 
that Peter's plan came into conflict with God's plan. That we see here that despite learning from Jesus, despite seeing everything Jesus was doing, Peter still had his own plan in his head. He was wanting to see Jesus conquer the Romans. He was wanting to see Jesus stay in power, be the king everyone wanted him to be. He wanted to see Jesus live and be the Messiah he wanted him to be. Yet that was all crashing down in front of him when Jesus said that he was going to be killed. He was able to follow Jesus. He was able to sacrifice much for him. But when his plan came into conflict with God's, that was too much for him. And Jesus deals with this incredibly harshly. And he says, get behind me, Satan, for you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. And so what, why Peter gets this response? We might be wondering, why is, obviously Peter doesn't want his friend to die. Why, why, is that, why does that deserve such a harsh response? And I think what we have to understand that by an opposing the plan of God, Peter is aligning himself, himself with the plan of Satan. And that's the thing. There, are, there really are two plans going on. There is God's plan, and then there's the enemy's plan, which opposes God's plan. So we're either lining ourselves up with one of them. Now, in relating this to us, it is not bad to have a plan. It is not wrong to have a plan. I, I am a planner. I like to plan everything. But the issue we have to look at is, is your plan more important than God's plan? Is your plan more? bringing you into conflict with God's plan. And we all have plans in life. We all have plans for our careers, for our lives, for our families. But we need to look at three different things in regards to self-denial, in regards to our plan, because we are called to submit everything to God, and that includes our plan. So the first thing is, does my plan go against what God teaches? And And that's an easy one, but we need to be in Scripture reading it. Does my plan for my life go against what God is actually teaching me? And Jesus lived and died according to God's plan. Jesus breathed and spoke God's word all of the time. And in the same way, we need to submit ourselves to God's word, just like Jesus did. As followers of Christ, we don't have an option to determine what Jesus did. We see in scripture how Jesus lived his life very clearly. And Jesus submitted himself to the plan of the Father. And so we must as well. As well, are we leaving room for God to work and change my plan? Is my life so rigid, is my plan so set that there is no room for God in it? Have I made things so that God is unable to work in my life because I have set the plan? I'm not, work, I'm not waiting for him to work in my life. Has God, and, and in my life, God has, I find how God has really worked in my life is directing me through closed doors. And, and you'll have different experiences with this, but I find in my life it's a lot easier to direct a moving ship than it is to direct a ship that's not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. And in my life, I have God closed many doors. This apartment me and Abby were looking at, we prayed about it. It seemed right. We got affirmation. We went for it. And the door was slammed right in our faces. But that's okay. It's clear God has something better. He did not want us there. But if we never went after the place to begin with, We wouldn't have known. Next, is it all about me and my glory? And that's the thing we have to look at. Is the plan of your life about you? Is the center of your plan for your life to bring you glory? Is is that what it's all about? If you had to ultimately sum up the plan for your life, everything you were doing, is it about you or is it about God? And that brings us into our next point, which is self-denial in regards to to our purpose. So we see here in Mark 8, 34 to 37, it reads, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me in the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So we see Jesus saying it explicitly. To follow him means denying ourselves and picking up our cross. But what does that mean to pick up our cross? And I mentioned it before. We, use, we can use that phrase sometimes when going through hardships as a, as a motivation to deal with it. But what does it actually mean to pick up our cross? And so taking up your cross, to, to take up your cross and follow Jesus literally means dying to yourself. To the, and to the original crowd hearing this, lots of them were executed. The disciple Peter who Jesus rebuked, 
as per tradition, was crucified upside down by the Romans. He picked up his cross. He followed the disciple Paul. He was executed as well. I'm pretty sure all of the disciples, except for one, were executed in some circumstance, and it was terrible how they died. All of them died. Many of the early Christians died. The, the Roman Christians who the book of Mark is, Mark is written to were being put in the Colosseum and eaten by wild animals. They were being stuck on spears and lit on fire to be torches in parks at night. There are terrible descriptions of how these Christians were being killed. So that's something we look at. I remember as, as a young Christian for most of my life, I always thought, Jesus, I would die for you. If someone had a gun to my head and asked me, Josiah, are you a Christian? I would say yes, 100%. But then as I lived my life, I saw all sorts of hypocrisy in my life where I was denying Jesus in other areas. I said I would die for him, yet I kind of hid the fact that I was a Christian in high school because I didn't want people to think I, I was not cool. So there's all sorts of areas where we say that, Jesus, I would die for you in a second. But there's so many areas of our lives we've not given ourselves over to him. And so how do we have this type of radical faith where we would give up our life for Christ? And and we see in Acts 21, the Apostle Paul gets a word from a prophet that when he returns to Jerusalem, the religious people are going to turn him over to the Romans, and and that's going to kind of be the end of him. And we see that is what happens. Paul gets turned over, and he goes through a long process, and he is eventually executed. But Paul's response to this, Paul's response to his impending death is, don't cry for me. I'm ready to be arrested and killed for Jesus. Now, what I think we have to look at is, how is Paul able to have this kind of faith? Was he just better than us? Was he, was, did he just have a deeper faith than us? Was, was he just a better person than us? But I think why Paul was so easily able to accept his death is because the purpose of his life was not about him. Every area in Paul's life, he had already given over to Christ. So for him to literally die wasn't a big deal because every aspect of his life had already died on the cross. It wasn't a huge leap for him to physically die because he's given everything up. He's put it all down for Christ. He is that old self of him, even though he, we all deal with sin still, he's given it up to Christ. He's put that down. For Paul, by the time he faced literal death, he was able to. Because he's given it all over. A story my father-in-law always tells me, when he, when he was a youth pastor, and this was in the era of the Cold War, he, he had an event where he got different adults with real guns, but empty guns, to come into the church doing youth group, youth group one night and pretend like Russia had invaded, and they were taking over and they were holding the kids hostage. You could not do this today without going to jail, by the way. This, is, this was a different age. And so they have these guys come in. He, he announces to the kids, everyone, I've just, I've just gotten some terrible news. It seems like the Russians have invaded. They are taking over community centers. They are taking over churches. And, and as he was saying this, these men with balaclavas and guns came in and tied all the kids up. And what they did is they, this is crazy, they took the kids into a room and were asking them different questions about themselves, but would also ask, are you a Christian? And what was interesting was seeing the different kids reactions to this question and you you have this he tells me there's this one girl who had gone to this youth group her whole life been in church her whole life and she says in fear to them this is my first time here i've never been here before a friend invited me and then you had another kid who was there for the first time who said yes i am a christian and so you saw these kids with different reactions to what they saw were russian soldiers but then eventually they were told that it wasn't an actual russian invasion they're furious at them But we don't, and and it's not likely we're going to be invaded by Russia, but we do not know our life circumstances. And there are many areas in our lives where we are on display. We are telling the world whether we are Christians or not. And our actions, our decisions will answer for us. So to carry the cross means the purpose, the central theme of our life cannot be about us. The purpose of it has to be about Christ. So if you had to look at your life as a whole, if you had to look at your, your career, your relationships, your, your financial planning, everything in your life, is it ultimately about you and your glory? Or is it about the glory of God? And that doesn't mean 
that we don't work, we don't, we don't have a plan, we don't save money, but it means that in everything we do, we're not asking, will this bring glory to me? Will this make me better? And instead we're asking, will this bring God glory? And the way I'm using my finances, is this glorifying God? And the way I'm spending my time, is it glorifying God? In my relationships, the way I'm interacting with people, is it about me having fun? Is it about me enjoying myself? Or is it about glorifying God? So it changes our perspective. It's no longer on ourself. And we spend so much time on ourselves, but now it's all about God. We're asking about him instead of us. And next, our presentation. And what I mean by that is our actions, how we actually live out our lives. And in, verses th- in verse 38, Jesus says, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. So the people Jesus was speaking to were people who would all face severe persecution for being a Christian. For the Jewish audience, for them to say they were Christian at that day was huge. It would have meant persecution by their own people. Remember all of the history in the Old Testament. They faced persecution by empire after empire. And so for them, holding on to their Jewish heritage was everything. And so to then say the Messiah has come and he's come through Jesus and he's come in a way you never expected was huge. And we see people face severe persecution. They'd be ostracized from the community. And then for the Gentile community, for the Gentiles to accept Christ, their cultures believed in many gods. For the Roman Christians, they were viewed as, um, as very conservative because they only believed in one god. And when they didn't participate in pagan events, when they didn't participate in, the, in these rituals and things, they were persecuted for it. Because people didn't like them. They didn't like the Christians, the fact that they only worshipped Jesus and God. But look at what Jesus said to them. He said, what good is it to gain the whole world, to gain wealth, to gain power, whatever it is, if it means losing your soul? This world is so temporary. This world is so temporary and it will end. And I was watching this documentary, and it was kind of sad, but it was scientists. It was, it was an atheist documentary talking about, let's, it, was, it was essentially called a time lapse of the future. If everything just continues and goes on and on and on, what's likely to happen to the universe and the galaxy and our planet just over longer periods of time? And it was a talking about regardless of what happens on Earth, eventually, whether it's, they were saying, billions or trillions of years, the sun will extinguish Earth will either be destroyed by asteroids or a solar flare. Stars will eventually die. The uni- it, it was very depressing, though. Everything will just fade. Everything will die. There's no hope in it. That, that, ever, that If you don't believe in Christ, if you don't have a relationship with God, this is it. And even this world won't last. We're just, they believe we're just here for a blip in time, and that's it. No one will remember us. And what, you, what use is it to be popular in this age of comparison, so many of us can live wanting to be popular to our peers. Can you remember who the first five prime ministers of Canada are? I couldn't name you two of them. And these are some. And there's famous people. There are these world leaders who have achieved fame and power like none of us ever could dream of. And no one remembers their names. No one remembers it. To live for this world makes no sense. Because it's so temporary. Paul in Acts 17 is in Athens, and he's in a society very similar to ours, where there's, there's, it's very spiritual. <clears throat> and he's preaching about the gospel message. And they, they reject him, they call him names, they call him babbler, and very few come to Christ there. And so we see Paul's in a situation where he's not, he's not viewed highly here. It would be embarrassing to preach the gospel message to these people. It would not be a great thing to do. But to Paul, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what people think about him. It doesn't matter what people think about the words he is saying because it's not about him. It's not about him wanting glory. It's not about him wanting to look good for himself. It's about Christ. And in the way we live, are we dictating our actions and our decisions based on what we think will glorify God? Or are we doing it based on what we want, on our own comfortability? 
You see, to live in self-denial in regards to our presentation means we are living in a way that glorifies God. Even though we're free from sin, we're Christians, to live in a way that glorifies God is a huge responsibility. And for many of us, regardless of the words we say, people look at the way we live. We can have the best theology in the world. We can have the best knowledge in the world about God. But unless we actually live it, it won't mean anything to people. Because they see how we actually live. And is our own actions glorifying God? Now, where I want to end with this, and this can be a hard message. We look at this. We see Jesus is talking about picking up our cross. He rebuked Peter. And then he says, if anyone's ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of them when I come back. And this can be heavy. And we're not going to get to this this Sunday, but what we see in the text right after this is the transfiguration. We see Jesus appears in all his glory. They see him as as he truly is. And shortly after that, all of the disciples reject him. They all leave him because of what happened. You see, we all have moments of weakness. This is a journey. We're not all going to be there in this life. We are, we are on a course in which we will never actually be at the destination. We will never be where we want to be, but it's a process. It's a process of letting the Holy Spirit work in you, of convicting you of different areas in your life. It's about being in Christian community, working with one another, so we can point things out to each other lovingly, so that we can work on it and get closer in our relationship with God. And the disciples all had moments of weakness. They saw Christ in his glory. They saw him work, and they still had moments of weakness. And in the same way, we will as well. We will fail. Yet it's about a trajectory. Are we on a course that we're moving towards Christ, that we're moving towards glorifying him, that that every year we can look back and say, you know, even though I had failures this year, and we all do, even though I fell down a lot, I am slowly but surely moving uphill on, on this journey of sanctification, trying to look more like Christ. So does does your life plan, is it all about you? Is the purpose of your life all about you? Is your your life presentation all about you? And that's ultimately what what we're talking about today. Is your life about you? Or is it about Christ? And we see there, it's so easy to live for ourselves. Even as a pastor, we constantly have to check ourselves and the things we're doing. Why are we wanting our churches to grow? Is it about the glory of God? Or is it about myself? Is it just wanting a bigger crowd? And we have to live a self-denial of putting our old self to death. Not so we can miss out on this life and the experiences in it. And I'm going back to that like we talked about at the beginning. A life of self-denial is not so that you will miss out on this life. It's not so that you'll miss out on the experience is in this, in this world. It's so that you can actually experience Christ and his glory. That your life is all about him. In Matthew 13, 44... There's a parable about the the man who sells everything for the treasure in the field. And it reads this. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought the field. Are our lives like that? Is what we have found in Christ so valuable that we joyously are selling everything we have for it? That all of my, my self, my sinful nature, the things in this world I can experience... Am I throwing that all away because of what I found in Christ and the glory we have in him? And Scott and Richard, if you can come up and and, and begin to prepare us for communion. We're we're going to be entering a time of communion where we remember the sacrifice that, that Jesus died on the cross for us. Now, when we enter a time of communion, I think this is something where we have to check ourselves. We have to look in our hearts and ask ourselves, am I, do I get it? Am I living for Christ? Am I living for his glory that it, may, that it may shine through me? Or am I living for myself? Are we still in that mindset of the original sin where our lives are about our glory, about us? So before we go into communion, please just have a moment of prayer with me where we can just evaluate ourselves, look at our lives, and just how are we doing? How is our soul with God right now? And if you need to confess anything, this is a time to bring it up to God. Before we say that we accept the sacrifice of Jesus, that we're remembering him, are there things we need to give up to him today? So please join with me in a time of prayer before we hand out the communion elements.